I am able to be productive. I mean, you know, everybody's process is different, but I think largely in 2020, a lot of music is made in like some sort of home studio, at least a good portion of it. I, I, there's always something to do, you know, whether it's just writing or tinkering with production in your computer or whatever. I mean, basically I'm fortunate to have this space and maybe to your point to, you know, not living in New York, LA is a bit more sprawling. So you wind up living with a little bit more space. And then I also do have a separate studio space, which is shared within my own um, small group of collaborators. But, uh, and even, even then it's like, hardly anyone was there. So really, I I wasn't really hampered in any way, you know, it was just more, um, yeah, more just like mentally, if anything, like, it's not, it's not so easy to just be like, oh, okay, crazy, the world is nothing like it's ever been before, let's get back to making music, you know? You must feel, though, to some degree, like you're able to do a service, right? I mean, people are looking for some kind of escape. Yeah. I've always been a pretty, um, I'm, I'm getting better, I think in my old age, but, um, I've always been a pretty cynical person about my mu- music and like, you know, just wondering, like going through periods of wondering, like what it is I'm doing or what we're doing, you know, in music really like, and how it, how it serves the you know any purpose and i that's probably that's probably always been the case with me in life about everything i was doing as as soon as i had any version of critical thought but and 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 just to like not make it sound super dark i think it is what drives me to like push in different directions and you know and think about it in a healthy way to some degree but yeah i was also fortunate that like just as the pandemic was hitting this record that i'd been working on you know, for the year leading up to it, pretty much seven, eight months leading up to it was coming out. So there was like a, there was like this lucky moment where I felt like I could take a moment, you know, like just sort of, that's like a natural time when you might like stop and recharge before like recharging the creative juices and starting something else. So, and, and I will say that despite how confused or, or I don't know if I was confused, it was it, the pandemic caused such a, or it was so kind of, abstract that like I wasn't worried but suddenly I wasn't sure what meant anything anymore you know what I mean in this and not just the pandemic you know the the police brutality like climate and everything that's you know politically been going on it just suddenly was like that on top of kind of just finishing up a project that you've been involved in for just long enough to like be done and you know, lose a bit of perspective, wasn't sure what was going to make sense right now. And when the Heim record came out and it was so well received, there was a sense of like, actually like maybe more so than normal, like uh, kind of grateful that I'm contributing something that does bring a sense of light to people in this situation. What's your relationship with a record once it's out? I mean, obviously like, you know, if you're in a band, there's a sense of obligation to kind of promote it, to go out and tour and all that stuff. But are you able to just sort of like move on and get to the next thing? Yeah, almost too soon. I think I have, like, I think that I like, the moment I finish something, I have to like reject it from my life for a little while. Like, it's like you just went through a breakup and you're just going out and like seeing as many people as possible. It is, it is like that. And, and in the same way that like, you have like an ex or someone who you've uh, given so much emotion, you know, to you once that, once that corner is turned, you have to almost like shut it down, you know, and like not see that person, not think about it. I do think like it takes me a while before I can appreciate it again. You know, like I don't listen to anything I make after, you know, and that's not because I don't feel good about it. I don't know how to explain it. It's like a very specific feeling. Again, I, every time I think the words that come to mind are so dramatic, like just like almost borderline trauma, but it's not quite trauma. This is a good relationship. It just didn't, it's just time for it to end. Yeah. It's just, a, yeah. You, you kind of exhaust yourself emotionally. Like, cause I really do kind of go in deep and, you know, in, in a lot of cases, maybe deeper than, than anyone needs to, you know? Like you, 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 I think, I think the, the depths in which 
I can lose myself in a project does occasionally give us something kind of transcendent in that project or, or maybe it, in a period of time of my work. But yeah, oftentimes you're just kind of like thinking and overthinking anyway. I mean, there must be times when you feel not necessarily detached, but you can't, you can't have that same emotional connection with every project you're working on. No. And, and, and especially not sometimes not singular songs, but with an album, it's hard to not get that one because you just, it just takes so long. You just entered a relationship, like a, an actual relationship with, this body of work and with the artists involved. I mean, obviously you've, you've played in a number of bands over the years. Is it, or can it be as creatively fulfilling in the same way? I do think so. I think they're two very different things. And I think that what, or, you know what, I shouldn't say that, but for me, they were very, two very different things. It, it, se- it seems like to some degree, I mean, obviously like, I don't want to like put too fine a point on it or, or put words in your mouth, but you know, it seems like in a case like a, like a vampire week and that you're almost like this extra member for that period of time it takes to produce the record. Yeah. I feel that way, you know, and I do. And, and so not, not from like a, it's not from like a, yeah, I'm just trying to think what it is that you gain from being a member of something. Because the major difference from working in the studio the way I do on records and then just actually being in the band is just like the burn you get from performing in front of people and feeding off of people's energy and like, you know, getting all the, getting that, but you know. You, you mean burn, you mean burn in a good way. In a good way. Yeah, like, or how, whatever you, however you say it. Just like the high that you get from that, yeah. you know? And, and, and playing live and loud and that sort of primal feeling, all that stuff is really fun. They're all just, very, they're like different, different parts of the project. And like, I think for me, you know, starting pretty early, I like, I had this like insatiable quest to, for making a record sound and feel the way I wanted it to, you know, or for songs to be as good as I wanted them to be. And that continues, but that was a lot harder to deal with when you're doing like an album every two years or something like that. You know, I never knew that I wanted to be a producer, but I think that I knew that I enjoyed working on the craft of, of writing and producing. And so when I say writing and producing, even as a band member, just being in the studio and being able to articulate what you're looking for, just working on the the language, working on your ideas, you know, like creating the space in your mind, understanding to, to even have those thoughts. And um, yeah, it just makes perfect sense where I wound up. You know, I really feel almost, I almost feel like I'm getting away with something. Like I get to be part of, you know, several bands rather than or several artist projects rather than just one when was it clear that producing specifically was something that made sense for you and something that that you know you could feasibly do as an actual career i think it was all i think it was a like definitely a lot of luck but i definitely think that when it started to like pay my bills i never really had anything to rely on like again not not a sob story but like i, I wasn't independently wealthy at all so I had a moment, you know, after being in bands when I was a teenager, when I finally somehow, I can't even think how I had this realization because when you look back and you feel like a kid and you're being, you're given the opportunity to go on tour and make all these like crazy opportunities that I never dreamed of, you know? I mean, you, you were, you guys are on Airscope pretty quickly in there, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, I was like a kid. Who knew what Interscope was? I was like, "What's Interscope?" And then, and then uh, I saw that Death Row Records, Dr. Dre was part of Interscope. It's like, oh, I know what that is, you know. And then suddenly, I realized, like, I I remember going there for the first time and bumping into Les Claypool from Primus, and I was like, I know that guy, you know. Like, okay, this is yeah. cool. You know, it was it was a very different world. You know, it was a very different label. I mean, it was literally an independent label back then. So, but at any rate, yeah, like just having all these opportunities just. It, it, it almost like on one hand, I question how deep my anxiety was my whole life that I would actually not get to a point where I wasn't enjoying that and have to like remove myself from that. But at the same time, I'm thankful that I somehow had that awakening that this is not for me, you know, because it's the type, you know, it's just like anything, like you can hang around something for way too long before you realize that 
it's not your true calling. And um, I had that moment and a really funny time, like probably about a year after my um, class of people would have gone to university or college. And I, I was like, what do I do? Am I like late to start figuring out school or am I like continuing on a different path in music? And I just had, you know, a series of events happen where like a friend, friend's older brother was graduating from film school, was working on like a commercial project and asked me to work on the music for that. And it kind of just gave me a, 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 an excuse to experiment in like a little home studio at my parents' house that I did, you know, made in the garage. And, uh, and that bought me some time because I like I earned a little bit of money, you know, and and then I just started like bumping into old friends because, of course, growing up, not even knowing so like subconsciously, I, like I was always attracted and there was always like an orbit of talented people around me. And, and I was attracted to that and maybe they were attracted to me, whatever it was. But, you know, you kind of arbitrarily end up in this group of three or four people and you make a band and you tour and that's like this thing that just kind of happened it's not by design and so suddenly i had this moment where i could like yeah collaborate with all these other people i knew and like this this guy mers that went to my high school who who was a rapper who had gotten signed by lp at def jux and he came over and we started playing around with you know trying to figure out how to make an album that was one of the first things i had done and and then you know of somebody I knew knew somebody else who asked me to just help this band and the student. They, they had this idea that I, it's all relative, right? Like I knew a little bit more than they did. So then they just asked me to be part of it. And I was happy to be, to be given the opportunity and any little amount of money was, was just enough that I needed to get, you know, life wasn't very expensive back then. And, uh, um, and just one thing led to another. And, and pretty early on, I had this like, very surprising success with that song hey there delilah by plain white tees which you know felt like really just luck and timing you know it was like completely bizarre and um and that gave other people the idea that i knew what i was doing but i, I always had like during that era of my life i like i think i was pretty again sort of subconsciously aware of trying to find my comfort zone because I didn't feel it when I was in that band at, at a younger age. Like I wasn't, I, I knew it wasn't quite right yet. And so I was sort of bouncing around finding what it was I was after. And, um, and it wasn't until a little bit later that I started to work with people like Cass McCombs and Deb Hines from Blood Orange and uh, started to feel like we were onto something that was both like, new and felt authentic to me and you know and everything and and again like at the beginning it didn't feel like anybody you know it was that wasn't a feeling of uh some great success breakthrough it was more just like a real like i don't know like cosmic like feeling of being in the right place in my life and then and then shortly after that those artists started to gain notoriety and and through that so did I, you know, and then like the, it's just, it, it's always been little steps and, and a very, it's been a very slow build. I, I just kind of got started very early. So it's hard to say the moment when it felt like this was it, you know, I still sometimes wonder if I'm going to have to get a real job, you know, but I still have my grandmother in my ear. You know? I've experienced this a lot with myself and other people where I was familiar with your with your bands and you know i was like i was a ska kid back in the day i did a ska radio show and to sort of like you know to to know somebody's name from something and then you know lose track of them whatever and then all of a sudden you like see the name you're like there's there's no way there's two people with that exact name it was hard at, at the time for my brain to kind of make that connection between like how how this person transitioned from from one thing to another but it sounds like it was pretty organic super you know, I mean, like, like, don't get me wrong. I love that era of my life. And I was a ska kid as well. I was just a lot of things. I was listening to ska. I was listening to, listening to hip hop. I was listening to punk. I was listening to music that connected all of that, you know, the clash and bad brains, you know, all the stuff, I'm, you know, fishbone, everything that sort of all, all that stuff was so progressive and expansive, you know, like how, how does a band like clash get from, their first record to their last record or second yeah. one, I 
I should say. You're not counting Cut the Crap? You know what? I've re-listened to that recently, and there's some redeeming qualities in there. Yeah, the production is bad, but I think underneath there are some okay songs in there. there and there's some ideas, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Just wasn't, like, refined. But at any rate, yeah, like, evolution, right? And, like, also, I think the period in which I was, like, soaking up all of my initial education and inspiration i don't want to make generalizations but when you are like in middle school you're just like a sponge and there was just so much going on in that era that was so interesting and exciting and i just felt lucky to be like around it you know and so inspired by it and i think that honestly it's just been like oozing out of me ever since there wasn't like a voice in your ear saying hey maybe i'm not the right person to produce a hip-hop record at that point in your life a hundred percent i mean that's why i never really did the only reason i worked with Merz is because he was a good friend of mine it wasn't yeah. like i never thought that i should be a hip-hop producer I actually like almost had some kind of sensitivity to like feeling like i shouldn't be one for obvious reasons I knew so you know I just I, I never wanted to like stick myself into a situation I just when things came organically I did I mean I worked with a, in that same era I don't even remember if it's like honestly some of that's a blur but I remember having Trey from the far side over it was like there was a bit of just like an LA scene you know and um I worked a little bit with mostly I was like just such a fan of all these people and that um Jay Swift who produced the far sides debut and uh yeah through through MERS I met uh Shock G. You met Humpty? At Humpty. He came over to my house. That was the crazy I remember like like working on something and looking out the window of my garage in Van Nuys and seeing Humpty sitting next to my mom on a chair in our backyard. My it was just too weird. But I think like I got over some of that weirdness so young that I just suddenly nothing seemed in, impossible, you know and and from that point on, I was just kind of trying. I mean, it sounds corny, but really, like, just trying to find what felt authentic to me, you know. And 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 throughout the years, I've definitely dipped my toes in things that I've, you know, realized just maybe weren't, you know, just in the end, it's not really what I'm meant to do. You know, I didn't even know, like, the I don't even know if there was one, but like a pop write, writing scene, pop music like writing scene, all that, all that stuff that's become so kind of so obvious. It, it really wasn't ever my world. And when I look back and without really thinking about it, when I look back on what I've been doing for the last 10 years, it's really a pretty small tight knit community of people. And even if it like breaks out to someone like Adele, it's only because I'd worked with Tobias before that, you know? So it all kind of makes sense. It's really not hard to, to draw the lines. I sense it was maybe like a little bit self-effacing, but when, the Plain My Tea song came out that people got the idea that you could do this thing. You know, were, were you still kind of unsure of your place in, in it and your your abilities to, to produce? I never really had too much to compare it to. So like, I guess I, you know, because I never went to school for it and I never really, I had like a few kind of like, again, like I absorbed some stuff and sort of had like, I, I hung around some people in studios that, knew what they were doing. Maybe not even that early though. I had some people who, in, who were gracious to me, you know, and like made me feel okay about what I was doing at the time, but no one with like any like huge um, successes that made me, you know, I definitely, I mean, in fact, and I've told this story before, I don't, but with the plain white tees, when I, when I did turn in that album, that song, Hey There Delilah, like, the label was kind of like, what is this? You know, like, it sounds like a demo, you know? And I was like, oh, really? Shit. You know, like, in my mind, I was like, I don't know. It just, like, made me feel something the way it was. And I, I don't even know if I had, if I could really articulate my feelings, but but I know that it, like, made me feel something, and I better just leave it at that. You knew it was something special at the time. Well, I just knew that I felt like, I shouldn't say I knew because I didn't know sure. anything. Sure. I felt it didn't need anything else. It just didn't seem, I didn't have any ideas of what this should be. You know, and maybe they thought it was, it should be like a big produced rock record. And I, I didn't know that no one bothered to tell me that, nor did I, nor, nor did I think that, you know, I think I heard them as sort of this like classic, almost like 
Tom Petty esque Americana band. I, I was like, you know, I was experimenting. I remember going for like sort of dead, you know, I guess you'd say more vintage sounding drums in a time when everybody was doing big polished rock drums, you know, like sort of distorted vocals. I don't know if I was kind of take leaning from like older records where things were naturally happening, like Iggy Pop or something, or maybe like the Beastie Boys a little bit, all the things that I just kind of liked, I, I was kind of going that route. I couldn't even tell you at the time that, you know, that might be considered lo-fi or something. I didn't even have these, this vocabulary, you know, and that, and that, or minimalism or whatever, you know, and keeping something simple, like, like that song, just acoustic guitar and vocal. And I just, when I turned it in, I got this overwhelming reaction of like, okay, let's see what we can do with this. And they, you know, had the record mixed by someone who tried to polish it up as much as possible. And then that song was, uh, you couldn't really do much with it. So, and it, and it took years before it, it took off too, you know? So it was like this funny story where it came out and had its life. And then they got signed to another uh, more major record label and then made another record and, and then decided somehow after the release of that record to st- stripe that song onto a new record and then it just exploded when i first heard it i i just hearing it on the radio i assumed i didn't do that i heard it and i was like oh crazy they sound pretty good they must I mean, they must have gotten like you know they must he, he like because i remember kind of like laboriously like trying to get it to sound that minimalist and confident like it when i heard it back i i just assumed that they just played it live on a new record and that was that but I've kind of gone on too long about that, but well, yeah, I didn't know that, that I had, that, that I knew what I was doing. And I, I don't know if you ever do, especially if yeah. you're like changing it up all the time. You're like almost starting, starting fresh and new every time you're just, yeah. You don't, the only thing I did have, the only thing I do have now that I did have then is just my opinion and my perspective, you know, and maybe now, now the biggest difference is that, just people, some people trust me. Is it overstating it to call it imposter syndrome? I think that 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 concept doesn't seem like insane to me. Like I do understand that. You know, when I when I started to hear that the idea of imposter syndrome, I was like, I know what they mean, but I don't know that I always feel that way. No, I just do think that it. I mean, God, I don't know what it is. I'm not. Yeah, I don't want to sound like impossibly like self-facing, but like it's just that I no, I I mean because I do think I add a lot to the projects I work on, but I I think that it's just I just dedicate myself and I have and I have an opinion, you know, and I'm pretty confident in my opinions a lot of the time. So, but whether or not they're right is another question, you know. Like sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. What does it mean to be right or wrong in a case like oh, this? Sometimes they connect and sometimes they don't. With the artist or with the, the, the general public or just you listening back to the song? Usually with the general public is what I mean because I'm not such a tyrant that in the studio, regardless of what the artist does, it's my way. You know, sure. we, we, definitely we, we, we're always taking a leap of faith and going down, you know, finding the zone and going down a road and then Sometimes when you get there, you're like, what the fuck have we done? You know, and then it's too late and then you put it out and then it's either people react to it or people don't. And you're right. I mean, it's not a matter of success versus or right versus wrong. It's just sort of a matter of whether it connected or not. I mean, obviously, luck is is always going to be a part of it. And obviously, you know, luck I, specifically was that it happened at a time when it like compelled me to keep going. I'm sure you listen to a lot of bands that aren't that aren't you know the, these massive hits i mean you know you can still do the right thing and not necessarily have something be a you know a big breakthrough success absolutely i just think that if maybe my job was to make those records no you might be right it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to predict how it would feel but you know there's definitely a point at which no matter how good you feel about the stuff you're doing sometimes it's like a hobby more than it is a career on your personal situation. A lot of contributing factors. I grew up in LA. I, I, I never knew the difference. You know, my parents moved here when it wasn't so expensive to live here, you know, come up, suddenly it becomes expensive. Suddenly you're like, you, I don't know. There's just some, there's so many things. I have no idea what would have happened if I was making records that I thought were pretty good, but not ever 
really getting making enough money to support myself with it. You don't know if necessarily you would have been able to continue this just as a hobby, like to, to do like the nine to five and then to just kind of do some music on the side. I guess the, the real question is, when did I know that this was my career? Yeah. You know, that's what I mean to say. Like, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, of course, I have no idea. But clearly, it's something that I want to do. And I say that because you know, you ask people ask you that question sometimes and clearly it is because I never stop being interested in it, you know, and, and trying to expand on, or I haven't yet, you know, and still like pretty much reinvest whatever money I've made into like musical instruments and gadgets and studio spaces and stuff. Cause it's just, it really is, it really has turned out to be a, a, you know, a lifelong passion at this point. But yeah, I feel like I'm like, I kind of like threw it a little off track, but. Do you get a sense of what somebody is looking for when they ask you to do something? Like, do you get a sense of like, when they're like, I want Ariel on this record, what it is that they're looking for? That's an interesting question because sometimes I do wonder, you know what I mean? Like, and, and I think that oftentimes it's a matter of like timing not to keep using the word luck, but like timing, whether or not I, I'm available to try working on something. And I think that I'm always up for a challenge of like, huh, what 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 is it that they're looking for that I could do on this? Let me let me let me play with it for a second or think about it or meet the person, you know, try to try to dig a little bit deeper. Because there have been some things where like the first time I heard something where I was like, I don't even know what I would do with this. And then and then sort of you know, secretly almost wrote it off and then something else caused me to uh, approach it again and and it turned out to be fruitful, you know. First time I ever heard a demo by Charlie XCX, it wasn't that I had an opinion about it, it was that I was like, I, I don't even know what, I don't know if I have a perspective on this, you know. And maybe I, you know, maybe I felt intimidated by it even. Like I just don't know what I, if I have what it takes to work on music like this. And then I met her and we just had like a chemistry and then we went in and started making music and it turned out to be great and it led to a lot of other stuff. So that's taught me to like, you know, really like push beneath like your first impression, you know, and I, again, not impression of whether I like it or not, but whether or not there's something that I, I can contribute to this, you know, and, and, and that said, you know, I, I don't, I don't love the feeling of working on things where I don't feel like I have something to contribute where it just becomes like, I can do it and I will do it. And sometimes that's a song or two on an album where I'm just sort of, I'm just using my trade skills, you know, that I, I know how I can make a song. I can produce. Has there ever been a point when you were, you know, banging your head against the wall so much that you, you were just like, I, I don't think that I can, I can do this or I don't think I'm the right person. Like maybe you should, maybe you should consult someone else. Not that dramatically. You know, I think I've brought people in sometimes to help. And to sort of unlock the puzzle. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Like, there's no ego in the project at all. Like, you know, I think I still have this, uh, I worry about the artist, you know what I mean? I worry about um, the music reaching its potential. And so I think about it, I put myself in, in the artist's shoes, you know, as a, you know, I just always still feel like that young kid in a band that had this like great sense of albums and history and legacy and, and sort of like the importance and the, the the you know the potential and the, the word I'm even looking for uh, the opportunity really to create something good and 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 not knowing how to get there and and not having somebody to like lead me through that and help me and, and nurture me and mentor me and pull all that out of me because it's not that I'm I'm I was a blank late or you know like didn't you know just I. There's a lot. There was a lot in me that just I didn't know how to bring out yet. And so you feel like specifically when you were in the hippos that you weren't getting the kind of guidance that you needed from a producer or a label in that way. Definitely, yeah. I mean, and at first it didn't matter. You know, I think sure. it's just you know, first it was just like fun, stupid joke. You know, and then <laughs> and then suddenly, before you know it, you're just you're like playing with the you know 
with the big kids and you're like, uh, you know, like I, I, I can see there are records that I love that exist on this level, but I don't know how to do them, you know, and I need to figure it out before I move forward. It was a weird time to like specifically that genre of music, but also just the record industry in general. I'm kind of impressed that you stuck with it because like you were really, you must have been run through the ringer and you were really there when everything was collapsing. I came up as it was collapsing and on some level that was, that was, uh, that gave me a leg up, you know, because as everybody else, or, you know, or maybe me not focusing on that gave me a leg up because it's like people were sort of running the other way or just like battling with like the problems of budgets or whatever it is. I was thrilled to be able to get Pro Tools at home and be able to work on it. I was like, whoa, you can do this. Like you didn't have these expectations because you hadn't been through it. And meanwhile, they were bemoaning the fact that they were losing access to all these things. Exactly. I was, I was, it was just at the right spot for me <laughs> because I think like just a little bit more time and a little bit more, I never had a budget, you know I mean? Yeah. We were signed to Interscope, but we were always rushing and like never having the time to really do it the right way. I, I was like, why are we doing it this way? Like, why, I, you know, things sound better on my four track and home and like I'm much more like at ease, you know? And then, and, and the moment I kind of realized that a lot of my favorite records are made more like that. You know, I, do you trust people? Cause, cause you're like, you know, obviously you're the record label. You must know what you're doing. And then at some point you realize that maybe most people don't know what they're doing. Yeah, and in fairness, I don't, nobody, you know, at the time I, I got to say like, nobody told me they knew what they were doing. Just nobody really cared. You know, it was like, it was like they saw something that was like doing its thing, you know, like there yeah. were people at our shows and they were just like, we'll take it. We'll take you, you know? And then they were like, all right, let us know, you know? And then, I, and then, and then it was like, oh, I don't think we did it good enough. Can we, you know, is there any way we can? No, there's no more money. All right, fine, fuck it. You know, <laughs> you know yeah. moving on, you know, and then, yeah, and every step of the way, it was just, I was lucky to be around friends. You know, we were, we were all friends. We had common interests in music and skateboarding and, oh. and uh, we were young enough to where nothing bothered us. We weren't like, you know, we really were like, so like we were sleepwalking like what is going on this is totally insane traveling for the first time in our lives nationally and internationally so it was there was no we had no complaints just at some point and that's kind of my point is like at some point i was just like i need to like figure this out you never went through a period where you kind of got just disillusioned by music or or the music industry not the industry because i don't even really feel like i i don't say you're not part of the industry because if you're producing Madonna, you're part of the industry. No, I was going to say I don't feel like I had any relationship with the industry until pretty late in the game. I mean, that's true. Like, I just never saw people like the people at Secretly Canadian or Lawrence from Domino as like part of any yeah. kind of music industry. It just really didn't feel like it, you know? Like from Bloomington, Indiana and, you know, somewhere in England, it just didn't feel... And like, I certainly never felt like Casper Combs was under any pressure to make like yeah. a hit. None of the tropes of the music industry played into my process for a long time. And honestly, I don't know if Madonna did either, you know, because I mean, once you at this point in working with someone like that, it's like there is nobody involved. It's like driving the train. I've definitely experienced it a little bit dealing with, with labels and stuff. But a lot of the artists that I've worked with, for the most part, are really in control of their own careers, you know, to, yeah, in, in, in a sort of insane, you know, like even when I started working with Vampire Weekend, they had never worked with enough, a person outside of their band, you know, hmm. you know, let alone had much input from their label or anything like that, you know. You don't feel that there's, um, you know, again, get kind of getting back to, hey, they're Delilah specifically when they heard it and they had different expectations about specifically what that record should sound like or, you know, perhaps what something that would potentially go on the radio should sound like. You don't feel like with, uh, especially when it comes to some of these larger artists that you're getting that kind of label pressure to sound a, a certain way? Sometimes. I, I can't even think of really great examples because I think most of the pressure we put on ourselves and whatever we decide the, uh, you know, I think that sometimes I've been in a situation where 
I've worked with an artist or I've gotten into like some sort of place where I'm like trying to fulfill some idea of like this like industry trope. But and, and I and I know it exists, but I'm just saying if you really like think about the records I've made, a lot of that hasn't happened. You know what I mean? Like think about like Adele or someone, nobody was telling me what to do Adele except for Adele, you know? From the story that you've told, it sounds like she wasn't even telling you that much either. No, and she, I think with her, and I think the same goes with someone like MITs at the time, my experience was either going to be like, I love it, or didn't really work out. It wasn't going to be this like, you know, back to the drawing board, try it again, buddy, like doesn't work. You know, I don't know. It just hasn't, for better or for worse, it's kind of, it either works or it doesn't, you know? And for that reason, I think you have to just like have your instincts on who you're going in to work with. You know? Well, can, can you have that sort of really profound connection with music, the, the, the creation, being a part of the creation of music of someone whose music you're not really a fan of, of something that you wouldn't listen to? Well, I mean, and this is not to say that I've not been a fan of things that I've worked on, but I don't think that that's how I really I can't exactly explain what it is that draws me to it but it's it's more of like a more of like a, a, a sense of purpose for, you know than it is like whether or not it's something that i would listen to at home had i never worked on it i don't know i mean it's hard to know you know because i'm working on stuff that before i worked on it i don't know if i really ever heard anything that sounded like it my taste is definitely not confined to like a certain genre or something there's no way to really know and in fact the odds are that if I worked on it, I don't want to listen to it. But, um, but I think that yeah, there's some some sort of there's some sort of um, just some kind of quality about a person that I'm working with that draws me to working with them more so than like necessarily. The, of course, I hear things and I'm like, ah, oh, I love that, you know. But that's not always the case. Sometimes there isn't even anything there. You know, like when I worked with Sky Ferreira, there wasn't, we didn't even have a song. There was just something, we talked about music and we just got along and there was like a chemistry and then we just created something. The certain producers you think of and they're bringing, you know, in some cases, or like Steve Albini, like a, a, a recorder, whatever he calls himself, but like they're, they're bringing it kind of a, a quality to it. And in a lot of cases, you can listen to a lot of different artists and realize that it's produced by the same person. Do you see your job as being this sort of bringing a, a, a definitive quality or are you kind of like filling the container and being malleable and doing whatever that person needs? Absolutely the latter. You know? yeah. I think there are things that I unknowingly have brought to different projects where you can, some people have been like, oh yeah, that part sounds like you, you know, but <laughs> mostly people who know me and know my process very well. As soon as, I'm used to it. I'm sort of over it. So I want mm. to kind of find something new. So, which I'm sure would be the case with anybody. But yeah. I think everybody just has their, what, what they do. It's hard. It's hard to, yeah, it's hard to imagine Phil Spector. I mean, like at what point does he feel like I've already done that? You know what I mean? Like it's hard for me to picture it because I'm a fan of all of it. So yeah. Yeah. But um, for me, I think I've just been really just, sort of getting into something for a few years and then like starting over and kind of find a new path and keep inspiring myself, you know? Um, but but you, you do find yourself going back and working with the same artists repeatedly. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And then it becomes kind of, and then with those, with those artists, um, ideally we sort of expand on, you know, we don't really repeat what we've done before, you know? And it's, and, and, and I'm learning that as I go, because I mean, at this point, you know, there's only a few artists that I, you know, I've gotten to a second or third project with because just it's time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting to like get to that point. The third album. Something I'm always curious about is how having done it for this long and and you know, as they say, like knowing how the sausage is made how that impacts your ability to, I mean, does that impact your ability to listen to and enjoy music? I don't think so. You know, I think I'm pretty critical of music, but I think I always have been, you know, there was always stuff I liked and stuff that just didn't do much for me. And I think that's still the case, you know, I still hear things kind of 
blown away. Maybe even even more so because I know how the sausage is. You know, it's, again, it's so hard to know what it'd be like if I were. Sure. But yeah, I mean, I definitely like. I definitely listened to music less than I did before I made records when I was but you know, we all do different things when we get older, thirteen years old or whatever. I've had an evolving relationship with music over the course of this pandemic. There's a period when I couldn't listen to music. I mean, obviously, like I've been going through other stuff at the same time, but there's a period when I couldn't listen to music. There was a period when all I was able to listen to was like post-rock and ambient music. And then I slowly like started building up my tolerance for music again. I think it's funny. I think it's also, um, there's something about the uh, ritual of how you discover music too, that, it's evolving so i mean maybe it hasn't evolved that much in a while but for me you know just like the difference like when i was a kid there was, it was just like so much fun to like skate to a record store and then flip through records and just look at like album covers and guess what it's going to sound like or look at credits and see like oh man you know uh, this producer did this or whatever it is or this is on that label and kind of you just sort of like get exposed to music in this sort of mysterious way whereas now a little different i mean like of course there's like playlists and stuff like new music friday which i do listen to you know and try to see stuff new stuff that's interesting but it's it's that stuff's all pretty curated you know and it's like not always curated to me or to any specific person so it's kind of tricky and something that i thought was pretty interesting is like the youtube algorithms Mm. I found that like if I search something, I start to like stumble upon other stuff that I maybe know about or, or versions of songs or live performances, and that's been kind of inspiring. In fact, I've been really kind of embarrassing. But I don't know if this is totally normal, but I don't pay for YouTube, and I've been uh, meaning to so I can skip those damn commercials because I actually do find that I listen to a lot of stuff on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 hard to um, watch a thirty second commercial for two minutes it, of content. It's brutal, and and also, I mean, and there is some kind of, like YouTube is awesome, and visuals are interesting. Um, whether it's like some kind of live live performance, or I guess oftentimes just like an album cover or some random image, but I do I do have to say there is kind of it, there is a slight disconnect to. And it sounds so stupid, but I do think it's true. And occasionally, you know, I do occasionally I uh, plop something on this record player and listen to it. And it is such a, it is a different experience, you know, yeah. like, yeah, yeah. Um, listening to records that are well produced in front of like some beautiful speakers. It's such a different experience than streaming low quality stuff on the internet. It's, I, I still get off on performances and I'm not like a fidelity judge. But there's just something that is hard to, I don't know if, you, if, you, if one can articulate what it is that really grabs you about that experience. I had signed something similar where one of the things that like got me through this is I, you know, I, I kind of became a Discogs junkie. I said, that's an Alice Coltrane record I've been listening to over there. And, and I think, I don't know, I think it's, and this is, you know, this is where we get into old man talk, but, but, but there is something, there's value in, in, in something tangible, but, but the thing that I keep coming back to is the, the great, I mean, the great thing about Spotify and all that stuff is, is the ability to discover things. But I think one, and, and the fact that like, I think younger kids have lost all sense of boundaries when it comes to genres, which is great, but you don't commit yourself to a piece of music. When you would go to like, you know, Tower Records or whatever and spend $18, you would make sure that you did everything you could to really sort of like absorb and appreciate that thing. When it's on when it's on a Spotify playlist, it's really easy to just skip it and move on to the next thing. And I know that all of the all of the stuff or most of the albums that I really, really love are the ones that like I, I didn't really like at first listen. No, that's true. And I don't know how you equate that the future or modern times. I mean, I don't know, you know, I mean, there's definitely people that still buy physical records and been on the benefiting side of that, you know, but uh, yeah, there's just no way to compare it. And, um, 
and yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know what, what there's, I mean, it's all those things, right? It's like what you said, like that, like that commitment, you bought it. That's what you have. You don't have any other choices. So you just listen to it up and down and, uh, and you become so much more intimately, um, connected. And then also, yeah, but there's again, like so many benefits to, music at your disposal yeah I guess it's just like anything else ups and downs and evolution huge unanswerable question so you know forgive me in advance but like do you, do you get a sense of how profoundly music is going to be impacted by something like COVID it really is abstract you know like of course yeah. everybody I work with I mean, I, I've, along with many other people, but not everybody, I've experienced releasing a record in the era. And um, I don't know how different, I mean, it's different, but I don't know, you know, it's been, it's been, I can't tell. Like, I, I try not to look at this kind of stuff, but I remember at some point hearing, and maybe this was just when the pandemic first hit, like these figures, like Stranger Now, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't know where they are now or what's going on and maybe it was just like your experience and the same as me where for a moment you didn't want to listen to anything and then maybe you started to like slide into it bringing you joy again and because I know that the record that we put out the record was like very well received and people seem to really have gotten into it maybe that is just because there was the space maybe I don't know I, I really just don't know yeah I don't know. I mean, it's definitely going to impact the economy. Because yeah. Really, most people make the money off of touring. Yeah. So that's different. There's a very pragmatic problem of just sort of like looking around and seeing all these bookstores and re- record stores close, like obviously like in New York. But then I generally listen to stuff that's at a at a specific kind of level of popularity and it's not really necessarily the people who are like able to make a ton of money touring or playing live. And I know that all of these artists that I love are, were already in a lot of cases kind of hanging by a thread and. Totally. And I think, I think everybody is always, I mean, obviously not everybody, but that's a lot of people are, are on some level hanging on by a thread. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the, it's fine until suddenly it's just stopped and then it's like you don't have like you can't you don't have like some sort of buffer period to get you through what might be the next who knows how many years of your life but but on some level it's funny how this happened because on some level outside of touring you know like everything you're saying bookstores closing record stores closing society's been heading this way for a while the part of it felt like sort of shocking but on the other side of it is like to be honest, I was shocked at the fact that, and, and sorry to just keep bringing it up high, it's just that it's the most recent experience. Yeah, but yeah. I was shocked at how many, I don't even remember what the number was, but they had some number one in physical records sold that week. And I was like, that sounds crazy to me. Because like in, a, in an age where you could just turn on YouTube or Spotify or anything, like what even compels somebody to go through the trouble of going onto that same internet and and filling out, yeah, pulling out your credit card information or whatever, and, and actually ordering something. That sounds totally insane, and, and is you know so obviously so grateful to these people who are clearly, you know, either want to for their own pleasure want to experience it or are just so dedicated to these artists they want to support, you know, and so you know there's like at the end of the day, there's like humanity in all this. And you realize that just like in back in the day when when we were kids and we're talking about these like underground punk and ska scenes and stuff there, there is just a sense of wanting to support. I don't know. I feel like it'll work itself out. I feel like there is, it does bring happiness. There there is a reason for it. and, And so people will continue to figure out how to do it. And it might not be the same on the same level that it was, but, you know, that's been evolving for a long time. I mean, some of the people I work with, we often talk about how, like, how on some level you're just like that court jester that's getting, like, tomatoes thrown at you. you know? Like, it's not always been a glamorous job, you mm-hmm. know, to be an 
entertainer or a musician or whatever. Uh, and it went through, it went through some highs. And like we already talked about, I kind of came into it as it was taking a major dip. So I think it's always been kind of wavy waters. And, and for that reason, anytime like a family member or anybody's ever like asked me advice about getting into the, getting into music as a career or whatever kind of funny questions that I never really even considered as it was, as it was happening to me, you know, I always just, my first impression is like, you know, you better, you better have no other choice. Yeah. You know, or just have to, you know, you need to do this. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise you're in for a rude awakening, you know? And I think maybe that is the kind of thing that connects me with the artists that I've worked with is, it's that sense of like, this just like, I, like we have no other choice. This is just like the only that we can do. And for whatever reason, this is, this needs to come out of us. And, and that's kind of like the, the unifying characteristic of artists I choose to work with. And Hopeful desperation, maybe. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Just like, we're just having this sense of like, there's something that I have in me that I have to give to people. I'd like to think of it as more generous than sort of like desperation for vanity and practical sense of like good purpose. <laughs>